Hi, I'm Henry. Thanks for watching this tutorial. We are going to discuss complex simulation specification. It's a tutorial for anyone interested in improving simulation in light of systems engineering. You'll see that there will be a particular focus on the notion of simulation needs. And it's important. We all want simulations which meet their needs. So again, it's a tutorial for everyone, and we'll start from the basics, like what's the specification. That's how the tutorial is structured. I'm first going to say a few words about who we are. Then we'll talk about the scope of the tutorial. We'll see why it's important to discuss simulation specification and simulation needs. The next section is an introduction to specification, because this notion is not that simple, and it's important to share a common understanding. We'll then talk about the specificities of complex simulation. And this way, we'll be ready to focus on the simulation needs. It's an important step that you may overlook, and it's full of very interesting challenges. And then, of course, we will conclude. I can start with a few words about me so that you know who I am. So I have a master's degree and a PhD in mechanical engineering. And besides, I think I started to be interested in complex systems well, as a student when I got the opportunity to contribute to LIGO, the Large Gravitational Wave Detector. I did my PhD with the French space agency CNES and ONERA. I worked on the simulation of an air launch to orbit system. You know, it's a system where a space rocket is launched from an aircraft it's for small satellites. I then became a system engineer at the European Research Center ELI in Hungary. Uh, this research center was under construction when I worked there, and it was all about the integration of its high power lasers. I'm now a research engineer at IRT SystemX. So SystemX is a research center for the digital transformation of companies. And I've mainly worked on simulation engineering and machine learning as well. And I'm now a certified systems engineering professional at Incosi. I can tell you a bit more about SystemX because it has an interesting organization. When companies want to collaborate, they can start a project at SystemX with a certain topic and a certain budget. And now the state doubles the budget with public funds. So at the end, the projects are half public and half private. You see here that one of our missions is to connect these companies here to the academic world here. Uh, we work in different fields like AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, IoT, or human-machine interactions. And we work with companies from different sectors like transport or energy or defense. Let's get back to the scope of the tutorial and let's see why this topic is important. Let's say that you work on the development of a system like a car. The system's development raises many questions, and many of them could be answered by simulation. When you need a simulation, you have to explain this need. And even if you have both roles, even if you do the simulation yourself, you must have a clear idea of your need here. In this case, a simulation can be developed, and the results will help you to take a decision. Let's state the obvious here. Your results you want them to meet your need here. From this point of view, the starting point here seems pretty important. But when you think about it, it's often quite informal. What's the exact system to simulate? Are there components which can be neglected? What are the system requirements related to the simulation? What is the simulation for? What should be the test conditions? Does the simulation need to be accurate or fast? All this information should be clear and ideally, in a format which allows traceability, but it's often more informal. This is the same idea, but with V-models. This V-model in blue represents the development of a system. The system is first designed and then integrated and tested here. The, the development of the system raises many questions answered by simulations. So we showed it here, but it's actually also true here, even if we didn't show it. The development of a simulation has its own V-model. The simulation is first designed here and then integrated and tested here. In this V-model, the definition of the requirements form a system architecture. If you design a car, it says how fast the car should be, for example. In this V-model, 
the definition of the requirements form a simulation architecture. It says how fast the execution of the simulation should be, for example. We always say that the development of the system must start with clear stakeholder needs. You know that one of the main stakeholders is, of course, the user. We need to know what the users will do with the system. If it's a car, is it to commute in dense cities or is it to go on holidays? And we also want to know if the users prefer a cheap car or a premium car. So the stakeholder needs are always considered as an extremely important starting point for the system. Everyone spends time and money in complex processes to get the stakeholder needs and justify their design choices. So I guess that you know what I'm going to say. The simulation needs here are also an extremely important starting point for the simulation. That's how the simulation can meet the needs, obviously. And that's also how we can validate that the simulation meets the needs, of course. You know, it's often represented here at the top of the V model. And finally, it's more subtle, but that's also how we can reuse the simulation. We can only reuse the simulation if we understand its purpose. This picture is interesting because it shows that there is a link between the simulation needs and the system architecture. We'll talk again about it. The definition of the simulation needs is often mentioned, like here in 1986 and here in 2021. This is actually from people we know very well in Germany. Set level is a German program. But it's still very hard to find detailed information about the simulation needs, and there is still no clear link with the system architecture. So the main objective of this tutorial will be to detail the definition of the simulation needs and we'll try to see proper links with the system architecture. Before getting into the details of the simulation needs, let's first talk about specification in general. It was important for us to have that kind of introduction, even if many of you are probably familiar with the specification. First, it's an opportunity to clarify your vocabulary. Specification, needs, architecture, requirements, we often don't all have the same definitions in mind. In this tutorial, the notion of specification will be a, a kind of envelope for the needs, the architectures, and the requirements. So in this case, the notion of specification is very important. In particular, because we have to understand it for both the system and the simulation. So here. What's inside the system architecture and the simulation architecture, for example? It's going to be very important because that's the way we are going to understand how they relate to each other. So let's see that. In specification, a key idea is traceability. Traceability is considered as an important tool to justify requirements. Ideally, traceability allows to trace back the chains of decision which led to a requirement. Let's say that you have a requirement on the battery size, like here. Where does it come from? Why does it have to be that size? Well, traceability can show that it comes from a requirement on the battery capacity, for example. But why does it have to be that capacity? Maybe because of the car range, which is 500 kilometers. But why does it have to be 500 kilometers? Maybe because the user wants to go on holidays with his car. We can distinguish in this chain of requirements two points of view. There is first the point of view of the user, who is a stakeholder. And there is here the system point of view. It's quite common to call that a need for the stakeholder and these requirements for the system. I think you noticed that's what we can understand with traceability when the requirements are already defined. But the development process is in the other direction, of course. You start with the stakeholder needs and then you derive requirements. Even when you have a clear vocabulary in mind, some situations can still be confusing. Here, the stakeholder need is clearly different from these requirements. But they are sometimes quite similar, the stakeholder needs and the system requirements. It happens when the stakeholders have an opinion about the system itself. For example, if the user needs a blue car, then the system is a blue car. If the marketing department needs a car range of 500 km to be as good as the competitors, then the car range must be 500 km. Gathering the stakeholder needs is a task which is quite difficult. Let's just mention two important challenges here. The first challenge is to take into account everyone directly or indirectly affected by the system. And it's not only the user. 
It can be people within the company or people outside the company. It can be normal people or professionals or even associations. And obviously, you don't necessarily have to talk with everyone directly. You can talk with representatives. I found interesting to see that this work on the stakeholders is now highlighted in the recommendations for AI systems. It's a way to mitigate the risk of bias against certain populations. You know, you want your image recognition to work with everyone, for example. It's also a way to mitigate the risk that some people reject the system because it changed the way they work. And you know that's sometimes the case with AI systems in particular. The second challenge is to take into account the stakeholder needs for the whole life cycle. It must cover the production phase, you know, with the people working on the assembly line, or the support phase, with the people replacing parts, for example, or the retirement phase. It's an example, but we sometimes hear that the retirement phase of the nuclear plants had first been overlooked. So you see that's something that's important to take into account, and that's not so easy. This life cycle that you see here is from the standard ISO 15288. You remember that the stakeholder needs allow to derive chains of requirements. Well, the definition of a requirement is not that easy. These references at the bottom of the slide provide different guidelines. In general, we say that a requirement must be necessary, implementation independent, unambiguous, complete, singular, achievable, verifiable and conforming. And we sometimes add other qualities. For example, I would say that a requirement also has to be justified, and that's why traceability is then important. But anyway, these qualities are for a single requirement. Then a set of requirements must also be complete, consistent, feasible and affordable, and bonded. All these qualities may seem a bit obvious. You know, of course, a set of requirements has to be complete, but it's important to always keep them in mind. I recently faced a problem with my car, and it was probably a problem of requirements. So let's use it as an example. I wanted to roll down the window of my son at the back of my car, but I didn't see that he had his fingers at the bottom of the window. So when the window started to move down, it pinched his fingers. The fingers were blocked there, and the window was just keeping on moving down, and I had no control. I got to pull his hand out of there. This scenario should have been anticipated, in particular because there is an anti-pinch safety. And the irony is that the problem is actually probably due to the specification of the anti-pinch safety. My guess is that they only considered the case where the window pinches when it moves up. In this case, the anti-pinch safety rolls the window down. But in my case, it had to roll the window up. So, my son's fingers are good now. But the conclusion is that it's important to have good requirements. This slide presents additional attributes for the requirements. So these are not qualities, they are attributes. You know, an attribute is an additional piece of information um, to characterize the requirement. For example, the traces here, they are attributes and they are used to justify a requirement. A few slides ago, when we talked about the battery size, the battery capacity, and the car range, you maybe noticed that we had requirements of different nature. We had requirements about a component, the battery, and we had a requirement about the full system, the car. This slide gives an overview of the different types of requirements. It actually comes from MBSC, Model Based Systems Engineering, where you can have actual boxes and arrows. But this overview is also true with classic textual requirements. If you are curious about MBSC, we'll talk about it. In this overview, if we look at the rows, there is the first row where the system is a black box. That's for everything we can see from the outside of the system. There is nothing about the internal organization of the system here. That's sometimes called the operational level. If the system was a human, that's where you'd see that it must eat to get energy, for example. There is then a row for the internal actions of the systems. If we keep the example of a human, that's where you'll see that he eats by first smashing his food and then assimilating the nutrients. That's sometimes called the functional or logical level. Be careful, the word functional can have different meanings. There is finally a row for the components, 
Again, if we keep the example of a human, that's where you'll see that he smashes his food with his mouth and that he assimilates the nutrients with his intestine. That's sometimes called the physical level. If we look at the columns, there is a column for the structure, for the states, for the dynamics, and for the performance. The states and the dynamics both represent the behavior of the system. The difference is that a state changes in case of event, and the tasks are done one after the other. You see that for some people, that's also functional, the states and the dynamics. So people use the same word for different things. The columns are all interrelated, like that, and the rows are also interrelated. Specifying a system with the good requirements and a good traceability is obviously difficult. Systems engineering offers processes to facilitate it, but processes can become dangerous if they are followed in a very rigid way. So I wrote down a few examples. First, specification must follow a logical order. If you develop a car, you first have to specify that it must reach 500 kilometers before specifying that you need a 60 kilowatt battery. Makes sense. In a similar way, it's considered good practice to specify the internal actions before the components. You remember these two levels in the overview. So the idea is to keep an open mind on the available components. However, focusing on the internal actions is quite conceptual and it's often very hard for people. So it's sometimes just okay to choose a component and its actions all together. Besides, here, you know that new technologies sometimes bring new ideas. That's the bottom-up approach. And it's also okay, even if systems engineering is often about the top-down approach. Regarding agility, so we hear a lot about it. I would summarize it like that. The idea is to quickly produce prototypes, even if they don't work well and even if they are functionally limited. It comes from software engineering, where the prototypes are progressively improved and you know where it's good to regularly show something that works. This approach is often difficult with cyber physical systems. You know that in our field, a working prototype is very expensive and it cannot be improved as easily as software code. It's harder to improve a metal bar directly than software code. Well, here I wanted to say that the INCOSI Systems Engineering Handbook mentions the tailoring process. You know, you don't follow the same processes when you develop a rocket, a car, a drone, or a phone. Processes have to be customized, and that's important. In a requirement manager, you typically have tables of requirements where the requirements are short sentences. You can see doors here, or Enovia, or RMCs. It's widely used, but textual requirements can be a problem. Uh, first, it's harder to process them because they can only be read by a human. And textual requirements can also limit communication. You know, we say that a drawing is worth a thousand words. So the answer to these limits is model-based systems engineering. In model-based systems engineering, if your system includes two interacting components, you just draw it like that. The most important is that the diagrams are not just pictures they form altogether a model. It's like a central database. Block A in these two diagrams is the same element of the model. If I modify the block A in this diagram, it will also be modified in this diagram. The standard 42010 is on this topic if you want. Here is, for example, a simplified representation of a data model that we used with several automotive companies. The data model shows the different types of elements that we can put in the central database and show in the diagrams. There is a first level of elements to specify the system as a black box. We typically start from a use case and we associate it to scenarios where there are states. And then the states can be represented in a state diagram like that. There is a second level of elements for the internal actions. In our data model, that's what we call functions. But again, be careful with this word. We can show the interactions between the functions in the diagram like that. And there is finally a third level of elements for the components. To apply MBSC, you need a language, a method, and a tool. The language provides elementary types of elements, like blocks which can represent components. It also provides rules regarding the possible relations between these elements, 
For example, a block can have a port and this port can be linked to another port with a connector. Finally, the language provides a standard graphical representation. You can see here on the right some diagrams in CCML, with you see some specific notations. CCML is the most used language. There is no equivalent. It comes from the UML language, which is used in software engineering. A consequence is that we can still see a certain influence of software engineering. For example, I would say that it explains sequence diagrams. Sequence diagrams can represent a sequence of interactions along so-called lifelines. And I can see that this notion of lifeline is not hard, but it's not natural for most people. Besides, I would add that CCML can require some training, for example, to understand the difference between composition, aggregation, and association, or between proxy port and full port and interface block. Again, it's not that hard, but it needs some training. So the risk is to create a silo of experts. And ideally, I would say that the specification should be easy to share and easy to discuss. So it could be a problem. In addition to the language, you also need a method. Let's just say here that there are many different methods with many local non-standard practices. Some methods are pretty old, like FAST or SADT, and some are more recent, like SESAM or Arcadia. Recent methods try to be more comprehensive than old methods. Finally, in addition to a language and a method, you also need a tool. It's a very active field with continuous improvements. You can see here Capella, Genesis, and Cameo. I would say that most tools need some training. They cannot be directly used like paint. Besides, I would say that the main risk today is the risk of misuse. You know you believe that you specified something, but you actually specified something else. Or maybe that you copy-pasted data in a kind of dirty way. It often happens at the beginning. And the next point, it may look like a detail, but I believe that it's an important limit today. Diagrams generally don't fit well in the reports or in the presentations. They are often too big, or the text is too small, or it's hard to see the arrows. Anyway, there are maybe exceptions, but it's just to share my feeling in case you don't know this kind of tool yet. Well, this was the last slide about specification. We have now an introduction to complex simulations. So in MBSC, requirements are formalized. They are not only in a text format. For example, with a state diagram, you have clear states and clear transitions between the states. Contrary to textual requirements, that can be theoretically tested. We call simulate the events which trigger the transitions between the states to see if the states change as we expected. That's the idea behind model-based testing. Model-based testing is often based on the UML language, though. It's more associated to software engineering than to systems engineering. The test is often not about the whole model. We can see here that there is a lot of interest for the execution of state diagrams and for the execution of activity diagrams. Besides, a lot of systems engineering tools can actually execute state diagrams now. I, I know that Cameo can do it, for example. It's maybe interesting to see that the tool Papyrus is often used in research papers in software engineering. Anyway, something important to understand is that to test a specification, it needs to be fully formalized. MBSC improves the formalization of the specification, but it doesn't necessarily make it fully formal. Some people say that CCML is a semi-formal language where you still have some natural language. And that's maybe for the best. After all, we are talking about a specification language, not a programming language. This slide gives you an idea of the kind of diagram which can be tested. You have a state diagram here on the left. The idea is to simulate the events here to see how the states change. You have here an activity diagram on the right. In this case, the idea is to change these conditions here to see how it affects the sequence of tasks. And you may be wonder, but in general, when you simulate an activity diagram like that, the tasks are not actually done. You just check the order of the tasks. This kind of direct simulation of the specification is interesting when you don't try to control physics. You know, in this kind of system, you get inputs, you compute them, and you show outputs. Let's call that kind of system a software system. 
It's different for cyber physical systems. You know, they are based on control physics. For example, a robot may control the physics of its motion. In this case, running the specification model directly doesn't make as much sense because it only includes the system specification. It doesn't include any physics. You know, for a model, it doesn't include some of the forces equals m times a. So you don't, you cannot compute a. System specification is a human design choice. It's something that you decide about the system. You want the mass of the car to be below 1.5 tons, for example. Here I used the term physics, but that's in a general sense. You know, books tell us that U equals RI, or if F equals MA, or E equals MC square, but it's not a human decision. And it's not about the system besides. Then you may wonder, why don't we add physics in the specification model? It's quite tempting, right? Because it will decentralize system-related data and it will allow the execution of the specification model. Even the vocabulary makes it tempting. You know, it's about the specification model and physics modeling. So it's all about models that we could merge. But the word model can have very different meanings. So we have to be very careful with that. Some people like David Long from Vitech highlight that using the word model for model-based systems engineering and specification model was maybe not the best decision. We could have used another word. So could we mix all that? The first reason to question it is that a simulation is always fit for specific needs. It's never good at everything. If you simulate a car, you maybe want to simulate its general dynamics or the temperature of the air, like here. And if you want to simulate the temperature of the air, there are many ways to do it. It's pretty obvious that they made some simplifying assumptions here. You can see the boundary. And we could have made other simplifying assumptions. If you simulate some dynamics, some models focus on transient phases like here. So in physics modeling, we try to simplify nature. But which simplification would we add to the system specification? The second reason to question any mixing is that a simulation has its own requirements. For example, we may want a simulation which can be fully executed in less than a minute, or we may want a simulation with a certain accuracy. So should we also mix the simulation requirements with the system requirements? They are different, right? There is also the so-called topology. It refers to the way blocks are organized in block diagrams, because the system specification can represent components with blocks. And simulations can look similar to the system specification in this case. It's particularly true for 0D simulations, like here in AIMSIM, but it can also be in Simulink, for example. You know, 0D, 0D simulation is a simula simulation where the only derivative is the time. Well, these simulations look similar to the system specification, but be careful. Their topology is actually different. For example, in this simulation, you can see a car in the middle of the components, like control unit or battery. In the system specification, the car is not represented among the components. It's a block which includes the components. So that's a typical topological difference. You also have another example here. You don't see these blocks in the system specification. It's, a block, it's blocks to set the temperature. And it's not an error of AIMSIM. AIMSIM is a simulation tool. It's not a specification tool. You remember that, that the architecture of a system has different levels. The black box specification is derived into internal actions, and the internal actions are allocated to components. Well, a simulation has its own architecture. There are conceptual models, which are then implemented in models. The models are run in simulation tools, and the simulation tools are installed on computing hardware. I think that you start to understand that a simulation can be considered as a product in its own right. And that's actually highlighted in the INCOSI Systems Engineering Handbook. As simulation is a product, it has its own development team with specific skills. You can work on a system without personally dealing with differential equation solvers and time steps and the shape of finite elements, for example. That's different teams. As a final confirmation, simulation, of course, has its own life cycle also. So you see, it's a bit hard to mix the system and the simulation. It's two different things. And again, what simulation are we talking about? A system specification can be simulated in many different ways. 
So simulation is hard to automatize because it's complex. And that's why simulation uh, has its own life cycle, has its own development team, its own architecture, its own V model. It's to handle complexity. As simulation is a product, its development should start with a clear simulation needs. This section now is at the heart of the tutorial. It's a topic which is often overlooked and which can be useful to everyone. Let's take this example. It comes from the AMC project on simulation engineering at SystemX. I won't get into the details, but it's about an autonomous car which can pass traffic lights. It's the design phase and a simulation is required to choose a control and a sensor which minimizes both the cost and the consumption. I like this slide because we made it at the beginning of the project with the, with the different automotive companies. And so it's a natural, non-optimal re representation of the simulation needs. There is obviously not all the information required to start a simulation, but what's the required information? And the format, PowerPoint, is obviously not good for traceability, but what are the alternatives? If you have to remember one slide, it's this one. It's the composition of the simulation needs. They should include the part of the system to be simulated, the objective of the simulation, the simulation requirements, the test scenarios, the data for simulation calibration and validation, and finally, the verification and validation of the simulation. But if I need a simulation, I should not simply write this information in a short email or in a PowerPoint, right? So how can I specify all that in a complete, easy and traceable way? Let's start with the part of the system to be simulated. It's a subset of the system architecture. So how to extract this subset? Well, there are two decisions. The first decision is the simulation scope. Let's say that these are the internal actions specified in the system architecture here. You'll remember that we call them functions. You may ignore F2, F4.1 and F4.2 in the simulation. For example, if you simulate an autonomous car which passes traffic lights, you may ignore its air conditioning system. The second decision is the level of detail. You know, you may ignore F1.1 here and F1.2 to have a generic simulation of F1. For example, F1 may represent a sensor and you may want a generic simulation of the sensor without its internal details. So it will be quite tedious to select everything by hand, but that's when formalism and traceability help. Let's see what it looks like in MBSC. You maybe remember, this is the first level of the data model I showed before. It's the different types of elements we used to specify a system as a black box. And here is a process to choose the simulation scope. The black gears, like here, they highlight the human decisions. The other steps are automatic. You start by choosing the use cases associated to the simulation, like the use cases are here in the data model. You know, use case is an important achievement of the system, like passing traffic lights or following another car. Just like you can start to specify your system with the use cases, you can start to define the simulation scope with the use cases. And then all the related elements can be automatically identified, like scenarios first, then states, interactions and activities, actors, etc. etc. So you see the idea is to make a selection at a high level and then progressively grab all the related elements. Tools offer more and more functions to take benefit from the logical links, but unfortunately there isn't anything for the simulation needs for the moment. So we made a prototype in a CCML editor, Papyrus. It's based on the exam example of the autonomous car passing traffic lights. That's a use case diagram which says that the car should be able to stay in its lane, to pass traffic lights or to follow a car. You remember in our example, the simulation is about passing traffic lights. So we added a menu here, it's after a right click and it selects all the related elements in this diagram and in the other diagrams. For example, if we go to this state diagram, we added a menu also here to see the current scope of the simulation. And we can see here that the simulation is only about the state active. For the level of detail, the idea is to unselect sub-functions or sub-components. The process is shown here in detail. The challenge is that the functions and components are not independent. The functions are allocated to components.
These diagrams here, they show the hierarchies of functions and components. Be careful. These are not interactions. These are hierarchies. So, and you can note also that the last level of functions is allocated to components. So why is it a challenge? Because we must keep a consistency between the level of detail of the functions and the level of detail of the components. Let's say that we want a generic simulation of F2. In this case, F5, F6, and F7 will be unselected. To keep a consistency with the components, we follow the allocations to C6 and C8, and from there, we move up to their common component, C2. All the subcomponents of C2 can be unselected. Again, tools don't include this kind of function yet, but let's have a look at a prototype we made in Papyrus. This diagram shows all the functions and subfunctions of the system. It's an hierarchy, just like in the previous slide. In CCML, it's called a BDD, a block definition diagram. So, as before, we first added a menu to see the scope of the simulation. And we also added a menu to unselect subfunctions. We can do it, for example, here, if we want a generic simulation of the function provide power. Of course, this choice propagates to other diagrams. This diagram shows the interactions of the function. We have the menu to see what's part of the simulation here. And we can see that this is consistent with the previous diagram. We can also see it for the components. With the same kind of menu. Anyway, we understood that the key idea is that we must use the system architecture to communicate about the part of the system to be simulated. The simulation needs should also include the objective of the simulation. You know, you can use a simulation to optimize design parameters or to validate that a requirement is satisfied or to compare to technical solutions. The objective is often defined in natural language with a sentence or sometimes with mathematics, you know, I'm thinking about optimizations. In this case, the objective function or the constraints can be defined in a mathematical form. But there is something very interesting which is rarely considered. When you think about it, everything in the objective of the simulation relates to the system architecture. In our example, if we want to test a car at a traffic light, it's because there is a use case for that in the system architecture. If we want to minimize the consumption, it's because it's a requirement in the system architecture. We don't just decide to minimize it like that. And our design parameters, they are just requirements which are waiting for their value. All these links between the objective of the simulation and the system architecture, they are generally not formalized, and it's a pity. Formalization improves information consistency. Formalization also improves automatization. We didn't show it here, but we made a prototype which automatically formulates the objective of the simulation based on the selection of requirements. So it's very convenient. Formalization also improves reuse. It's easier to find a past simulation if its objective is clear and formalized. The simulation is a product and we are in the position of the user, so we must explain all our requirements. For example, does the simulation need to be fast? Is it for real-time applications? Do we need documentation? After that, there are the meta requirements, quality, cost, and delivery. Of course, there is a cost. There is the cost of the model development, the cost of the simulation tools, and maybe the cost of a computer if we need to buy one. After the cost, there is a delivery. You know, it's always a, a trade-off. You may want to finish the simulation development early, but it may be more costly or it may result in a lower quality, or you may accept a longer simulation development. After the cost and the delivery, there is finally the quality. This reference here is very interesting. It defines quality indi indicators along the whole simulation life cycle. And these indicators are not quantitative metrics. They actually challenge the quality of the simulation, sometimes with questions. And one question is very important. Is the simulation accurate enough? We all wonder that. It's generally very hard to tell, but Let's see, at least, what it means to be accurate enough. Let's say that there is a system requirement to be below this limit. We don't know the actual value y, but it's maybe here. 
Let's say now that we want a simulation to know whether this requirement is satisfied. If the simulation result is here, the simulation is close enough to reality, and we know that the requirement is satisfied. Let's say that H0, our null hypothesis, is that the simulation is close enough to reality. You'll understand later. If the simulation result is here now, the simulation is not close enough to reality. Because of the simulation, we think that the requirement is not satisfied. Let's say that H1 is our alternative hypothesis. Here are the different possible cases, with H0 here and here, and H1 here and here. I don't know if you are familiar with notations like H0 and H1, but it actually comes from statistics. In statistics, the problem is presented like that. It's either H0 or H1 which is true first. You remember that H0 is the hypothesis that the simulation is close enough to reality, and H1 is the hypothesis that it's not. And so we can believe H0 or H1. If we believe H1 when H1 is true, well, it's not a problem. It means that the simulation is under improvement. It will be done when we believe H0. If we believe H0 when H0 is true, the results are valid, so it's perfect. If we believe H1 when H0 is true, it's not good. It means that we want the simulation to be further improved while it's actually already good enough. So it's over-engineering. Finally, we can believe H0 when H1 is true, and it's maybe the worst. It means that we believe in invalid results. If we use the same vocabulary as in statistics, the case with over-engineering is a type 1 error, and the case with invalid results is a type 2 error. So let's call beta the probability of invalid results. You have to know that beta is not equal to zero, and I know it's hard, but you even have to think about the beta that you can accept. Of course, it's hard to say 1% or 0.1%, and it will be hard to measure it anyway. So instead, it can be qualitative. Do you want this error to be improbable? Or would you accept it if this error is possible? This kind of level, you know, is used in safety. Statistics tell us something that I find very interesting. When you reduce the risk of invalid results, you statistically increase the risk of over-engineering. Frankly, if I didn't think about writing the problem like that, I would have probably neglected this rule. Now, if you want a simulation to rank different solutions A, B, and C, like here, so you also need to specify beta, and you need to specify a discrimination threshold, like here. Should A be considered as equivalent to C, or can it be considered as better than C? So, in every case, the risk of invalid result is not easy to estimate, but it shouldn't be ignored. Simulation needs must also include test scenarios. Again, be careful to the vocabulary. The word scenario can have many different meanings. Here we are talking about the environment that the system must face in the simulation. For example, here we test this car with another car cutting in here. So we chose a straight road, but it could have been a curvy road, right? And the line is dashed here, but it could have been a solid line. And what if this car slows down suddenly? So all these are different scenarios. We can also take the example of the car passing traffic lights. So it can be on a straight road with a traffic light in 500 meters, or it can be on a circuit with multiple traffic lights. All that are different test scenarios as well. The test scenarios became a hot topic because they are both very important and very challenging for autonomous systems. They are very important because they reveal the behavior of the system. By nature, a complex system has emerging properties which are hard to predict, so the test scenarios can reveal them. Test scenarios are important, but they are challenging because they must represent extremely large operational domains. You can think about a car. It can face an infinity of different situations. We often talk about test scenarios for validation, in particular in the automotive industry. So in this case, you are in the situation where the system is fully designed or where a subsystem is fully designed, and you want to make sure that it respects its requirements. But test scenarios are also important during the design phase, 
you want to optimize the parameters, then what test scenario do you use? I find this bullet point both very interesting and overlooked, a bit like for the objective. You know, the test scenarios are in an instantiation of the environment defined in the system architecture. The system architecture says maybe that the car must be on a road and that it can handle all the cars. But here we test a specific road with a specific car positions. And this relation between the system architecture and the test scenarios in general is quite overlooked. Finally, it's interesting to keep in mind that the scenarios are always progressively refined. It starts at a high level, where we can just talk about a straight road, for example, and it's then progressively refined with the help of people working on the simulation. At the end, we have to know even the contact properties between the road and the wheel of the car, for example. Here are some of the main challenges that people currently work on. So first, there is the choice of scenario. A car can face an infinity of situations, so what should you test? There are some initiatives to develop large databases for the automotive industry. They often use accident statistics and reports to identify key scenarios. Without this kind of database, we would spend years testing cars in situations which are maybe not that interesting. My, my institute is working on AdScene with Stellantis and Renault, and I've also heard of Safety Pool. There is also the content richness. How do you organize all the choices that you make in the test scenarios? For example, you know, for a car, you have the road, the, the infrastructure, the objects, the weather, the communication. So how do you organize all that? This figure has been reused in the German program set level, and uh, we also work on this kind of uh, question at my institute with the, the project AdScene. Temporal modifications are not easy to handle. There is an example here. It's a car which cannot see the bicycle coming from its right. It's never easy to show a temporal evolution on a picture. But there is another difficulty. How do you represent the behavior of the system? Because that's what you want to test, so you don't know it yet. But the behavior of the system is important. It can affect the behavior of other people in the environment. For example, if the car slows down here, the bicycle may feel safe and try to quickly cross the road. But what if the car suddenly accelerates here? As I said, traceability with the system architecture is overlooked, but it's important. First, it will be an easy way to understand that this is the car you test and not this one or this one. You know, it's not easy to see in a picture like that. It will also be an easy way to compare your test scenario to your requirements and it will maybe make you think, okay, this is a car cutting in here, but what if it's a bicycle? And finally, it will help, as usual, to find, understand, and reuse uh, scenarios from similar simulations. There is not really any tool yet for this kind of traceability, but we made a prototype in the CCML editor. So it opens an interface like that, with the system architecture at the top, and a graphics editor here. So you can sketch your scenario with lines and rectangles. And to say that this rectangle is your system, you click one time on the, rec on the rectangle and one time on the, on the system. So the sketch is not a simple drawing. There is a traceability with the system architecture. Then, so you can also add annotations, for example. I told you traceability facilitates our reuse. So we used an AI with metrics learning to find existing scenarios and load them in this interface, for example. But we won't get into that detail now. Finally, I told you that scenarios are progressively refined. Well, that's easy to say, but how to do it properly? How to formalize this process? There are guidelines for the scenarios of military simulations. That's from SISO, S-I-S-O here. Even if it's quite specific, it's interesting. So they distinguish the operational scenario, the conceptual scenario, and the execu executi executable scenario. Sorry. In the simulation needs, we deal with the operational scenarios. The simulation needs can include data for simulation calibration and validation. So what's the difference between calibration and validation? Let's say that the black dots here are reference data and that your simulation outputs the orange curve. During calibration, 
you adjust simulation parameters here to get closer to the reference data. Validation is different. You check that this simulation can correctly predict other reference data, like the gray square here. So calibration is somehow similar to the learning phase in AI. Reference data can come from an experimentation or an existing simulation. Be careful, these data are not perfect. They are not an exact truth. You know, we may think that when we look at these exact points on this diagram. Experimental measurements may not be very accurate. So it's interesting to know the uncertainty interval of the reference data. Also, the reference data in the simulation often don't represent exactly the same thing. The reference data can represent a former version of the system or a system that we consider similar. But with the simulation needs, we have a very good description of what the simulation represents. If we had a similar description for the reference data, we could compare them to make sure they are similar. But it's still an open challenge. Finally, the last part of the simulation needs is the verification and validation of the simulation. Be careful, we are not talking about the VNV of the system here. We are talking about the VNV of the simulation. We sometimes say that the verification is to check did I build the thing right, and that the validation is to check did I build the right thing. It's often not very well distinguished in simulation, but the general objective is, for example, to check that we represented the correct system. That's conceptual model validation here. That the simulation is accurate enough. That's operational validation here. Or that there is no programming errors. That's implementation verification. There are various techniques. It's an interesting reference here. And you see that it mixes verification and validation. I like the Turing test here. You know that normally in the Turing test, a machine is considered as good if you cannot differentiate it from a human. Well, the same way, you can consider a simulation as good if specialists cannot differentiate its results and real data. An important rule is that the simulation VNV must be discussed from the start in the simulation needs. But it's not something that you should arbitrarily specify. It's something that must be discussed with the simulation developers. And you shouldn't discuss it in detail, but you should typically agree on the general type of VNV first. For example, is it qualitative or quantitative? And you should also typically agree on the VNV agent, who is responsible for the VNV. It can be the developer, but it's better if it's someone different, like someone from a dedicated team. Or even better, it can be someone from an external organization. If you ask for the simulation, you can also discuss whether you should be involved in the validation. You perfectly know the system, so you could help detect some problems in the simulation. So we've just been through all the information to include in the simulation needs. And so again, it's maybe the most important slide, this one. I wanted to say a word about the format of the simulation needs. We said that it was important to have formal, traceable, complete data. So it requires a computer-readable code like that. We developed a prototype to export the simulation needs as an XML, for example. But it's also important to have a human-readable summary in a Word document, for example. Many CCML editors work on the export of documents, but it will need to be adapted. And as I said before, diagrams are sometimes too big for a document. It's not easy. And before we finish, I wanted to mention current standards. Practices vary a lot. In the US, the Department of Defense standardizes practices with all its military contracts. But in general, in the world, people work in different ways. And it's particularly true for the simulation needs, which are quite overlooked. However, here are two interesting standards. First, there is a MIL 3022 by the Department of Defense. It's a standard for the documentation of verification, validation, and accreditation for models and simulations. It offers different document templates, and some paragraphs are actually related to the simulation needs. For example, there is a paragraph for the problem statement, a paragraph for the modeling and simulation requirements and acceptability criteria. And finally, a paragraph for a basis of comparison. But something interesting is that these paragraphs are not grouped, so they are not identified as simulation needs. They are in different parts of the templates. Beyond the templates, the standard offers a clear vocabulary, so it's interesting to use it. There is also the NASA standard 7009 for models and simulations. 
It's less about templates and more about processes. It tries to quantify complex properties like the level of validation, but it's a bit special. Anyway, this standard is also interesting for its vocabulary. Well, let's finally conclude. First, the simulation of a complex system is a digital product in its own right. So the development of a simulation should start with clear needs. They are the only way to validate the simulation and it facilitates its reuse. You need to understand the purpose of a simulation to reuse it. There are still important challenges. We showed how to improve the traceability of the simulation needs, but there is still a long way to go to achieve full simulation traceability. We need tools and methods for the simulation development which follows the definition of the simulation needs. We actually work on that at SystemX. Then, if you compare new simulation needs to a repository of past simulation needs, you can reuse scenarios or simulations. But how to compare the simulation needs? As an example, we work on ontologies, graphs, or machine learning. Finally, we mainly considered classic physics modeling. But simulations are now sometimes generated with data, with machine learning. Sometimes they are hybrid, they have both classic physics modeling and machine learning. The word digital twin can have different meanings, but it generally refers to simulation with machine learning. So it will be interesting to identify the impact of these methods on the simulation needs. All these are interesting research opportunities, but from a more practical point of view, we can standardize practices regarding the definition of the simulation needs. Well, if you are interested in simulation needs, if you want further details or if you want a reference document, please follow this link to find the article we published on this topic. Thanks for your attention and feel free to get in contact with me.